Welcome, I hope you're blessed in the Lord today. In this video, we want to continue to talk about the error of cessationism. It's an unbiblical doctrine that's, that was created by men and brought in and enforced in on the scripture. It's based on experience. It's based on the fact that after the first couple centuries of the church, that uh, the miraculous gifts seemed to wane and there was less. And so they will base their theory on experience of the church instead of going back to scripture. But we want to go back to scripture and we want to test cessationism because there is a lot of danger in this movement because it will cause us to take this unbiblical philosophy and cause us actually to turn away from what the scripture plainly says. For example, the scripture says, do not quench the spirit, uh, do not despise prophecy, but test all things, hold to that which is good, and refrain from that which is evil. So those in the cessationist camp will not test prophecy. If somebody prophesies, they won't try to test it and hold to that which is good. They'll just say, nope, that's false. It's all false because they will despise prophecy. They, if somebody stands up and prophesies, they will despise it. And so that's a dangerous thing to do. They will forbid speaking in tongues, what the scripture says clearly do not do. They'll, say, they'll come up and say, well, that's not the same tongues that was spoken then. They'll come up with a lot of different things, but they will come to the scripture and they will flatly deny it. They will flatly disobey it. They won't pursue spiritual gifts, especially that they prophesy, because they despise prophecy. And so... Because of this, we don't want to fall into this error and, and fall into this we become like Sadducees. The Sadducees, were, they denied everything supernatural. The Pharisees accepted the supernatural, but the Sadducees denied it. And many of those that are in the cessationist camp have become like modern-day Sadducees. They will reject anything supernatural. And even if you show them a miracle, they'll say, well, we still believe in miracles, but you show them a miracle, you, you talk about a miracle, and they'll say, no, 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 I don't doubt it. Oh, you're just too gullible. So in practice, they deny all supernatural ministry. Now, that's not all of them, but many of them do. And I'm talking mostly about those in the modern cessationist movement, those back in the days of the Puritans, those in the first and second great awakening, those among the Methodists. They did not deny these things. They, uh, they, even though they were cessationists, they did not deny the power of God. They still welcomed the power of God. And even though they didn't call them the gifts of the Spirit, many things worked through them like the gifts of the Spirit. Even, even Charles Spurgeon, who was a very hardcore cessationist, he tells testimonies of things that were actually things like words of knowledge and, uh, and maybe even prophetic giftings. And so we saw that the gifts were still working even through those that didn't believe in them. But nowadays, the, there's a, a strong Sadducee camp that denies it all and will label everything, everything supernatural as very questionable. And if it's called a gift of the spirit, they'll say that's wrong and that's evil. So we must not fall into this camp. Now, in the last video, we started talking about the apostolic sign gifts. This is a, a phrase used by those in the cessationist camp. They are the one that coined it. They're the one that invented it. And they say that what that means is that it's apostles. So it all is related to the apostles. It's related to the ministry of the apostles, that they were given certain giftings. They were supernatural giftings. They were signs and wonders that were done through them so that they would confirm the ministry of the apostles. We looked in the last video that not, not everyone who does miracles is an apostle. And some in the cessationist camp will say, yeah, that's true, because it was only through the laying on of the hands of the apostles that somebody could receive these supernatural apostolic sign gifts. But after the apostles died, it, didn't, it eventually died out with those who had received the laying on of hands by the apostles. This, was all, this is all unbiblical. This is all made up. But we want to ask the question, particularly in this video, about the apostolic sign gifts. Are the gifts, the supernatural gifts that are spoken of in the New Testament, were they given with the express purpose and the only purpose of confirming the message of the apostles? Or did there, were there other purposes that the scripture t clearly tells us? And there are. So did, did God use these uh, signs and wonders to confirm the ministry of the apostles? Yes. Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12, he talks about the signs of the apostles, that he did signs of the apostles. What does this mean? It doesn't mean that everybody that does apostle uh, signs is an apostle, but it means that all apostles, he infers, that that shows one of the evidences that he's an apostle because he does miracles. If he did not, then the question would be, how are you an apostle if you don't have the signs of an apostle? So we saw that sometimes they will confirm the ministry of an apostle. But there's other reasons that are given. If we go to Mark chapter 1 and we look, uh, we look at verse 40. A leper came to him, this is Jesus, pleading with him and kneeling before him saying, If you are willing, you can make me clean. Then Jesus moved with compassion, extended his hand and touched him and said to him, I will be clean. As soon as he had spoken, the leprosy immediately departed from him 
and he was cleansed. We see over and over again in scripture that many of the miracles that were done were done because of the compassion and the heart and the grace of Jesus Christ. And so the idea that all the miraculous gifts, and, and, and we, we say, well, what about the apostles? Do we think that whenever Peter was, uh, was there and, and Dorcas had died and all the people were gathering around and telling what a wonderful lady she was, how she helped the poor and telling all these things, do you think his heart was not moved as he prayed for her to be raised for the dead and she was raised from the dead? Of course, God's heart is involved in all of this. So one of the reasons that God does supernatural things, you know, many in the cessation camp will say, oh yeah, but those are miracles and not the gifts. Whatever it is, the reason that God does supernatural things, the reason he works miracles is many times because of his compassion. That doesn't mean that he always has to work miracles, but it means that he's moved with compassion. He's not just trying to uh, fill out some form like, okay, I've got to do this in order to, uh, to prove that the apostles are true. No, he's got a heart and he's reaching out to people and he has compassion on people. So that's one of the reason for miraculous works in the New Testament and in our day. Jesus Christ is still seated at the right hand of God and he still reaches his hand out with compassion. We need to understand and not try to fit everything into this little false box of cessationism. Now, the other thing, if we go flip over to Mark chapter 16, Another reason that the gifts are given is this, verse 19. After the Lord had spoken to them, this is after his resurrection from the dead, he was received up into heaven and set at the right hand of God. So that's where Jesus Christ is still seated now. This is, he's still ruling on the throne of David, as it says in Acts chapter 2, that he is now seated at the right hand of God, which is the throne of David. He is now the Messiah, the King of heaven and earth, and all authority in heaven and earth has been given to him. That's where he's seated, and he's ruling over his enemies until he makes his enemies his footstool. He's ruling in the midst of his enemies. So we need to understand what happened then. Jesus being raised to the right hand of God is still in effect today. He's still there and he's still acting the same way. Verse 20, then they went out, went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming that they were apostles through the signs that were given. Oh, I guess I was wrong because it says here that it was, okay, so he confirmed that they were apostles through the signs. So maybe the cessation apostolic sign gives is true. Not because we read it in what it actually says, not what we're supposed to read into it. It says this, then they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word through the accompanying signs. Amen. So Jesus Christ was confirming his word, the word of the gospel, just like he confirmed the word of the gospel when Judas went out to preach when he was still on earth and he would go out and did miracles in Jesus name and healed people in Jesus name. He wasn't confirming Judas. He was confirming the word that he was preaching. And that is what Jesus is doing at the right hand of God. Now he, those that go out to preach his word, many times he will do signs and wonders to confirm that word, which is spoken. We see this also if we flip over to Acts chapter eight. Verse 5, we looked at this in the, in the last video. Verse 5, Philip went down to Samaria. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. So he went to proclaim the gospel, the kingdom of God, and the things concerning Jesus Christ. Verse 6, when the crowds heard Philip and saw the miracles that which he did, they listened in unity to what he said. So what was the effect of the miracles. What kind of miracles? Verse 7. For unclean spirits crying out with a loud voice came out of many who were possessed and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was much joy in the city. So when they saw the people having demons cast out, when they saw the lame walking, when they saw all these things, the paralyzed being able to move and to walk, what was what did what what was the effect of this? What were the consequences of this? It said they listened in unity or they listened intently to what he said. Gospels cannot the uh, uh, miracles cannot save anyone. Miracles are not meant for salvation. They're meant for confirmation of the word of the gospel. As we proclaim the gospel, the gospel is the power of God for salvation. But what will cause people to listen? Many times what God uses to cause people to listen is miraculous signs and wonders. The power of the kingdom of God coming and showing itself in their midst. By, as Jesus said, the kingdom of God is coming upon you because I do miracles by the finger of God. By the spirit of God, I cast out demons. And so by the power of God's kingdom coming, people are able then to see the miracles and they pay close attention. And so this is what miracles often do. It's for the purpose. So these gifts, these sign gifts, these signs are done in order to confirm the message of the word of God, not just to confirm the apostles. It wasn't uh, when, 
whenever Philip was doing these things, was God confirming Philip? Well, he was. He was confirming Philip and he was saying, this man is speaking my words. Listen to his words because they're mine. So yes, he's confirming Philip, but only because Philip is preaching the word of God. And so we need to recognize that is one of the purposes of the miraculous gifts in the New Testament to draw attention. Now, some will say, well, that's just experience driven Christianity. If you tell people you've got to go out and, you know, when you preach the gospel, that you also pray that signs and wonders be done through the holy name of Jesus Christ and that people will, will listen carefully to the gospel, that is experience driven Christianity. It's experience driven religion and it's dangerous and it contradicts, contradicts the sufficiency of Scripture. If that is so, my cessationist brethren need to answer me this question. Why is it that in the New Testament, whenever the apostles went out to preach the word, the sufficient word of God, when they went out to preach it, why did God do signs and wonders? From the cessationist viewpoint, he did signs and wonders to confirm what they were saying and who they were as apostles. So was that experience driven? Is that something dangerous? Is that something contrary to the word? Or is that something that points to the word of God? It is, of course, something that points to the word of God. In the first century, the miracles that were done by Jesus Christ, the miracles that were done by the apostles, the miracles that were done by Philip the deacon and Stephen the, the deacon and, and by others in the New Testament, uh, whenever Ananias was just a disciple and he laid hands on Paul to receive the spirit and to be healed of his blindness, when these things happen, they weren't just experience-driven Christianity. No, they were experience, experience of the living God. The kingdom of God had come in their midst. The power of God had come. You know, the kingdom of God is not word only, but in power and demonstration of God's power. And so the word of God came and the gospel power came with it to point back to the gospel so people could be saved and believe in the gospel. This was not experience-driven Christianity then, and it's not experience-driven Christianity in a negative sense now. It's the same thing it was then, that the word of God is confirmed by the message of the gospel. So let's go to one more in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. The gifts that were done in Corinth, they were also done in Rome. It talks about prophecy in the book of Romans. It talks about a do not despise prophecy in, in Thessalonica. And then we see it throughout the book of Acts. And we see it as miracles done in Ephesus and other places. So the supernatural gifts were prevalent in the day of the New Testament. They were given and they were practiced in the church. This is why in Corinth, uh, in, in Thessalonica, in Romans, that they were given instructions about the giftings. Uh, in Corinth, we see the most detailed instructions. And what we see is not only the giftings that were done in Corinth apart from any apostles. They were done by the normal believers and the leaders there in Corinth. Those that were happening there... When we see this, we have to ask, well, why were they happening? Were they just pointing to the apostles back in Jerusalem or somewhere else? No. It says in verse 7, But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to everyone for the common good. For the common good of the church. These were not even sign gifts that were done outside of the church. These were things that were being done inside the church. These weren't even confirming the message of the gospel unless unbelievers came in and heard somebody prophesying, and then they bowed down on their face and said, In truth, God is among you. So this is not primarily for unbelievers. These gifts were for the building up of the body of Christ. If we flip over to chapter 14 and we look at verse 3, it says, But he who prophesies speak to men, speaks to men for their edification and exhortation and comfort. So when we prophesy, we're prophesying to the body of Christ to exhort them, that is to challenge them. To comfort, that means to encourage them, to edify the body of Christ, that the church would be built up so that we would be able to do the work of ministry. This is what the giftings are about. Verse 4, he who speaks in an unknown tongue edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. I desire that you all speak in tongues. My cessationist friend, do you, believe, do you desire that everybody, every Christian speaks in tongues? Because Paul did. I desire that you all speak in tongues, but even more that you prophesy, for greater is he who prophesies than he who speaks in tongues, unless he interprets so that the church may receive edification. Because in the body of Christ, the gifts of the Holy Spirit are given for the edification, the building up of the body of Christ, not for the apostles back in Antioch or in Jerusalem to be confirmed as apostolic ministers. No, they were given for the building up the body of Christ. The body of Christ still needs to be built up. So we need to follow New Testament Christianity. 
We need to do what the New Testament tells us to do. We're still living in the age where Jesus is seated at the right hand of God, and we need to submit to him. We also need to pray to him that he would confirm his word so that his gospel would spread quickly among the lost. In the early church, the gospel often spread because of miraculous miraculous things taking place, like in Samaria, that pointed people to pay attention to the gospel. That can happen today. That's still happening today. And so we need to pray that that happens. Why? Because we want people to pay attention to the gospel. We want them to hear the words of the gospel so that they can believe, so that they can repent, so they can trust in Jesus Christ and be saved. Hope this has been helpful to you. God bless.